I'll introduce you and we'll uh hold on a second. We got Alchemus again. Uh, he's introduced me to this Victor Schoberger, very interesting character. And uh, we're gonna watch um, this video, and it's a guy who he translated Victor's books into English, so he knows quite a bit about the man. And just in case anybody doesn't, uh, you know, know who Schoberger is, like me. I had no idea who this guy was. Yeah, bro, I don't know too much more either, but because I only found him like a couple of months ago, but uh, bro, he got so much interesting stuff, like basing everything upon uh, nature, you know, without destroying nature. Yeah. Free he, energy. Yeah, exactly. Free energy. And he, he, he called it, um, comprehend and copy nature, right? So everything yeah, he did, he studied, he studied it, you know, he studied he studied the fish in the stream and how it moved in the water and you know just like the little simple things that happen in life like naturally like he studied them and realized how the natural forces work and how they they're the total opposite of how we make power and how we do things so he saw the yeah, invertedness the thing was in a non-destructive way he it saw the invertedness you know he, he realized how inverted everything was and he tried to he tried to help us out, but this documentary here, uh, well, it's a presentation that this guy made, and we're going to go ahead and get into that, and then when that's over, me and Alchemist are going to talk about Victor, and maybe we'll learn something from the documentary, so yeah. let's go. Cool, cool. 77, I've, I've translated a lot of his works, Victor's works from Germany to English. Um, and they are, the result of those is now out there um, if people are interested in getting hold of copy. Now, um, excuse me, I'm going to have to put these on because I can't see without them. And this is Victor Schauberger. Victor Schauberger was born in 1885 um, in a family of a long line of foresters stretching back some 400 years and who lived by kind permission of whoever's up there. Um, um, and they lived in um, Bohemia, in the forest, the deep, rich forests of uh, Bohemia. And so he had, uh, he had forestry in his blood. And I'll just switch forward, if this thing works. The family motto was Fidus in Silvi Silentibus, which is have faith or belief or trust in the silent forest or the forest of silence depends which way you want to translate the Latin. And Victor's probably most important um, dictum was comprehend and copy nature. And that is really the only way forward um, in terms of all our technologies and so on. I'll just flick back to Victor again. Now, Victor grew up also, as, as I was saying, in this rather remote area. Um, he had a very great gift for observation and perception, which uh, surpassed um, even you know, his, most of his fellow human beings. But even as a child, uh, he used to like to sit down next to a stream and watch the water, watch it move, watch the way it rippled and how it swayed backwards and forwards, all those things. Um, and he gradually, this was a game to begin with as a child, and then eventually he realized that he could detach part of his consciousness and let it flow away with the water. And when it was returned 
to him, it brought him information from those places that the eyes cannot see, as he put it. And it was through this, this development, this constant um, association with, with nature and the forest, that he built up his various theories. Um, he was, he's had two elder brothers, and they went to uh, a university, and Victor saw what happened to them uh, as a result of this um, association with academia. And he realized that they had lost some touch with nature, some touch of the deeper understanding of the forest, because suddenly their view had become shoehorned, and they, they weren't able to, they weren't as sensitive to things. So he refused to go, and his father was absolutely furious with him, but instead he went to a forestry school and started off as a, a low-level forester, working up gradually through the ranks. Then uh, the First World War came and he went to war, and then uh, after the war he was wounded, and after that he became in the employ of uh, Prince um, Adolf zu Schaumburg Lippe, uh, who was a German prince, but he had estates in Austria in styling. And he took Victor into his employ, and uh, Victor managed his forests. Um, this was another part of Victor's learning process, and uh, but there, if I remember it, and then if someone says that uh, there was a story about a spring which happened in those days, but I won't bring that up until I talk about spring. So if I haven't talked about it, someone say, hey, please. So um, anyway, this was after the First World War, and Schaumburg Lippe had lost a lot of money, and he wanted to... Uh, recoup some of his losses by selling off his very high quality timber which was uh, sited in rather remote locations, difficult access and so the problem was how to get the logs out of there. And he first went to the <coughs> Forestry Institute in Vienna and they sent some experts and commissioners down and they drew up plans for sort of concrete log flumes and and, and that was supposed to work. And when Victor heard about this, he, he, he approached Schaumburg Lipp and he said, look, I have an idea which I can uh, apply and help you with, uh, which is uh, about the third the cost of what they're doing. It'll work much better. Um, and so Schaumburg said, well, if that's the case, I'll take you on. It's against the expert's advice, mind you, but you know, if you're saving me a lot of money, uh, well, then I'll do that. But you're going to pay for it. And if it works, I'll pay you. If it doesn't, you take it down again. And Vicar thought, well, that's a, that's a good enough bargain. Um, the, one of the preconditions for its successful function was that his log flume had to deliver a thousand cubic meters of timber a day. Actually, it worked out on the first day, it delivered 1,600. So Victor was paid. So now the, the whole process uh, began uh, on the day that everything was set up and ready. The holding basin, which was at the top of this log flume, had to be filled with water because it was from there that all the rest of the flume was fed with water. And so on the opening day, everybody arrived and they stood looking into this basin, which is egg-shaped, as you see. Yeah, you can see. I can see here too. I've never done PowerPoint before. This is amazing. Um, so um, it was a very deep basin. It was quite you know, copious. It probably was about the size of, I don't know, maybe half this room or something. It was a big and quite deep. And so the time came to fill it up. And uh, Victor went out on the wall. Uh, here and stood here and said, look, I'm just going to, you know, oversee this, the filling. Um, and the commission said, oh, no, no, come back, you know, because the water's going to go in there. You're going to die. Don't, don't, don't. And, and Victor just put his carbine up in the air and fired two shots. And that was a signal to his foresters further up the valley to remove all the barriers from the store of water which was going to fill this thing. And there was a huge rumbling sound and frothing and uh, a noise, and around the corner came four meters of water with full of logs and goodness knows what else. And 
Victor didn't move. And the water, when it came in, flew, uh, flowed around the edges and, of course, the underside. And then it created a, a wave in the opposite direction, which actually slowed down the rest of the water coming in. And so the basin held. And according to static calculation, it was 12 times stronger than it need be. Anyway, when, when it was full and it was sort of settling down again, Victor went back to where this group of commissioners and indeed Count Schaumburg Lippo was, uh, and he said, well, there it is. And the commissioners, they were relieved, so was Lippo. And one of them said to him, oh, Mr. Schauberger, that's very interesting. Um, where did you get the idea for the shape? And Schauberger said, oh, well, a chicken gave it to me. He didn't have much time for officialdom. Well, now, <clears throat> this is basically the design of, the, of a later um, flume that, that uh, Victor built. This is at Norbert. As you see, the, the cross-section of this flume is egg-shaped, or half egg-shaped. And it's curving, uh, and it's made of wood. And when it was being built, the workers said, well, where do you want to put this flume? And Victor said, well, you see how the water moves in this valley and how it flows around here and so on? Just copy it. That's how we're going to do it. We're not going to go in straight lines. We're just going to follow what nature has already dictated for water to move in this place. So, in as much, of course, that they had to maintain a particular gradient. Uh, now, the way the flume worked is that in the settling tank, which is actually egg-shaped, I'm sorry, this diagram was drawn before I did the egg shape one. I didn't change this one. Um, and gradually, after the water settles, um, it stratifies according to temperature, so that the lowest temperatures are in the bottom. And Victor used waters of different temperatures uh, from different levels to feed into the flume um, at a tangent, so that the thing is with waters of different temperatures is they don't mix. And this is the secret of why his system worked. Because he developed, or he, he initiated these vortices with a very colder water in the center, which were able to carry logs heavier than water, because the only way, place that a heavier log could float was in the center of the heaviest water. That's where it was. And he was able to transport these logs right down the center of the flume without touching the sides. Now, the water, as I said, was taken from different levels, and, and it would rotate one way or the other way. Um, I'll just nip forward to this one. Um, he had slats uh, uh, set in the sides of this wooden flume to cause the water to rotate clockwise on right-hand bends and anti-clockwise on left-hand bends, always keeping this vertical movement um, happening. Now, occasionally, along the way, because these various stratified waters uh, mixed and then the stratification was lost, he would put in what he called energy water, and that would come from a stream along close beside the, uh, uh, the flume with pretty cold water, maybe five or six degrees centigrade water, and some water was let out so that the, the, the volume of water in the flume was made, maintained at a constant. And this, this new um, energy water was fed in from the side. Well, the thing is that even there with these um, uh, measures that he put in place, the flume was much more effective in the morning than it was in the afternoon. Because a block of wood, the time it was taken, this flume was two kilometers and a half long. And a block of wood was placed in it and the time taken for it to go from start to finish. And that uh, took 29 minutes in the morning and 40 minutes in the afternoon because in the afternoon the water had become more exposed to the sun and had become tired and didn't want to carry things. Uh, that's just the larger design of flume which he, he built for moving much larger than long, big, big logs. And <clears throat> 
coming back to you know his voyages out into the out into nature, he came on one of his uh, walks across a very high lying stream, and he was about to jump over it with his staff uh, when he saw a trout in the stream dash away upwards, and this caused immediately a number of questions to to go through his mind. First one was, how did the trout get there? Because he knew that a kilometer downstream, the stream disappeared into a veil of mist and fell, I don't know, something 60 feet. So how did it get there? And why, why did it dart upstream? When, I mean, that was against the water, much simpler to go downstream. No, no, upstream. And how did it stay, actually, in the water anyway? Because it was sitting in this fast-flowing stream and just doing this with its tail gently. No effort. So, actually, he examined it, and the trout sits in the stream where the, water, the, the coldest water is present, where the vortic, vortical motion is greatest, um, and because of the shape of its body, let's say the filaments of water accelerating past the body, which are closest to it, form a, a turbulence or a reverse vortex in the back of the tail. And this actually pushes the, the trout forwards. The trout sits in the middle because in this vortex, all the food and little things it likes to eat are right coming straight into its mouth. It only has to sit there with its mouth open. But on thundery days or when days when the weather is worse, then the stream, because of the change in energies, it doesn't flow quite as well, and the trout gets hungry and starts jumping about, which is why uh, you can catch trout better on a thundery day than you can on another day. So, but this, to this um, process of the actual shape of the body of the trout, which you can see is actually a complex egg shape. This is all grain shape. Uh, that's what the trout's body is made up of. And an egg, and these shapes have a great affinity with the movement of water. But in the process of this um, acceleration upstream, of course, the trout breathes through its gill system. And like us, it extracts the oxygen and, and other gases come out. And so what happens here is that these sort of yellow um, bubbles come out of the gills. They're oxygen deficient, and immediately they want to uh, reabsorb oxygen. And the reabsorption of that oxygen increases the volume of the water behind the fish, and the fish is shoved forward like a bar of soap. So <clears throat> this will probably come back to you not, uh, but I want you to remember some things there. This is a photograph taken from below, uh, showing a trout in the vortex. Uh, another one actually going up into a pipe. The trout seeks out the vortex. That's how the trout actually rows uh, up this uh, stream on where Victor Schauberger was. Because in Victor Schauberger's view also, there were always two movements of energy in the stream. There was the energy of gravity, which uh, took the water down into the valley. And at the same time, there was another energy which went from the valley right up to the spring. So we had, in a sense, the, the, the gravitational effect and the levitational effect. And before I get off fish, because actually I wanted to mention this as well, um, because of the success of Victor Schauberger's log flumes, the Austrian government decided to ask a retired professor of hydrology, Dr. Felix, professor Philip Vorheimer, to examine his theories. And so Schauberger didn't really want to have him around, but he was very polite and um, never asked any stupid questions. And so anyway, they came to a stream where Forkheimer and, and Schauberger were looking at this trout. And um, Victor waved his stick over it and the trout went <laughs> upstream. And Victor said, now, Professor, you tell me why Strout fly, flees upstream in fear. And the professor scratched his head. And Victor said, oh, well, because it didn't have an academic training like you. 
And they got on actually very well, and they were friends. Um, and then at one moment, because this was, had, had been set up, the fish, and Victor knew where the fish was, but he'd also organized some of his foresters to have a cauldron of water of about 100 liters, about 200 meters upstream from where the fish was. And when the fish came back to rest, Schraubiger gave the signal and his foresters poured the hot water into the stream. And as soon as the hot water hit the stream, the fish started to struggle and flap its tail and move backwards downstream. Because, as Victor claimed, the levitational energy moving from the valley to the spring, top of the mountain, had been cut by the heat. Gradually, when all that heat dissipate, dissipated, uh, then the trout came back to where it was and peace and tranquility were restored. But these are just some um, uh, computer programs which I'm eggs, showing how fishes can be derived from eggs. Uh, I'll pass over it. And an interesting thing here is a little experiment which you can do. This one has a ping pong ball in, in it, and this is a, a gas jar. Normally you can get it any, well, find it in most laboratories, I suppose. Uh, and this is a ping pong ball filled with a saline solution, so it has the same specific weight as an egg. And if you stir it, you have to stir really hard if you want to get this ping pong ball to rise. And sometimes it won't. But if you stir, put an egg in there, fresh egg, and you stir the water, you, you start quite fast to begin with, and then the, the egg wobbles up. And then you can slow your speed down, and it, as long as you keep on stirring, the egg will stay there, because the egg responds to the vortex. And it is why also the fish uh, use that shape. Um, in his um, remote, little, he, I mean, on Schauberger Lippers' estate, Victor lived in a little cottage in the, um, away from the main area, about five kilometers. And he, had a, he wanted to put electricity into the cottage. Electricity was a new thing, you know, in the country in those days. And so he devised a way of making electricity using a generator of his design uh, which used only 10% of the water normally necessary to provide the same amount of power. And what happened, oh, back again, um, the water was introduced through this uh, rifled pipe. This, I think, was the shut-off valve. It's not explained in the um, patent. Uh, and the water was then caused to rotate in a vortex uh, which then impacted on this sort of impeller looking like a shell. Um, while these um, edges are shown curved, in fact, the whole thing is made up of upward-turned grooves like this. Um, and the water imp impacts on those and, and spins it. And the last bit here, these last little tails, were to use up the very last momentum of the water before it fell out. Um, and these people in Austria, in uh, Schladming, uh, did set up this arrangement using an egg and a hyperbolic cone, which is uh, uh, the, the part of the math and geometry developed by Walter Schaubecker. And this was going to be attached to the bottom of it. Um, so the water was introduced into this egg, tangentially spiraled, a, a tremendous vortex was created aside, and then that vortex energy was then directed through this jet at the end of it. Uh, when I went there, they hadn't fitted it, and, uh, but they did try it out, and this cone of water was quite amazing. I took my shirt off, and I stuck my head underneath because I wanted to look up and see what it was like. Well, this water was just like putting your head under a knife. I mean, it was so sharp. It was just amazing, and cold, too. So, um, But no one's actually built one of those, as far as I know. The group uh, somehow um, fell apart, which is a great shame. Now, this is an experiment which was originally carried out by Rutherford about uh, 1903 or 4, and it's to do with the, the charge in water and how the charge in water can be built up. Uh, this is a device I made, oh, oh, it must be about 15 years ago or something now. Uh, 
Now water is introduced into this device just normally by a hose and on each of these arms is, the, is a hypodermic needle, the very finest hypodermic needle. And that water then, the jet from that falls through a cylinder of brass uh, which is coated on the outside with paraffin wax, which is one of the best instruments, uh, and then through into a receiving bucket. Now, in the bottom of this bucket, there is a brass strip, which is attached to uh, copper in this rod, and the copper in the rod is attached to the brass in this um, cylinder. So, in fact, both systems are, are connected uh, Di diagonally to each other. Now when the water falls through, you can hear it for the first two or three seconds, you can hear it hit the bottom of the, um, the bottom bucket and then afterwards everything goes quiet and you can't hear anything and then something happens and the charge field is broken and it, it goes, it, it releases. Now what happens is that the water falling through uh, maybe, and then I can't tell you which, it will develop a positive charge which is transferred to this uh, cylinder and a negative one to that one. Uh, this one, this uh, positive charge then turn, turns to negative in the bottom and this negative charge to positive. So a, a huge charge actually builds up and this is really a small thunderstorm, at least a thunderstorm on a very small scale because this falling water produces this um, particular charge, these opposite charges, and I attached a wire to the two things here, uh, to the two different um, uh, uh, charge collectors, and I got a spark which jumped two centimeters out of it. Now, the rule of thumb is that it's 2,000 volts for every, percent, every millimeter jumped. So that was looking about 40,000 volts. And I tell you, I really jumped when I, got, I touched the wrong thing. So that's, um, that was an experiment that Victor carried out uh, in Nuremberg uh, to show that the, you know, how water can develop charges. Um, and uh, this, is, this is really quite an interesting little example of how you can do it. Right, is this thing working? Um, I don't know how you can all read that at the back but I'll read it. The majority believes that everything hard to understand must be very profound. This is incorrect. What is hard to understand is what is immature, unclear, and often false. The highest wisdom passes through the brain directly into the heart. And I am put that up because now we are going to change our tack because I have to explain a little bit about energy before I can go on talking about water. Um, there are some things which have to be understood first. Ah. At the moment, we are, the way our um, society developed, we go back in time, the paths of nature, so to speak, or what might call eco-technology and our technology, uh, run, ran more or less parallel to each other. Um, nature system, evolution, it means development, increasing order, growth, stability, efficiency, and super economy. Because in nature system, uh, you start with, say, 100% um, capital, uh, and that is invested into new life forms, new niche uh, objects, new, new niche creatures, and so that represents a 10% perhaps profit on her, her original base capital. And then if you invest that 10%, then you get you know, another percent on top. And we should really be involved with living of the, cap of the interest of interest. Because nature's, in order to be, um, in order to evolve, you must operate at a greater efficiency than 100%. Uh, it's not possible otherwise. So why, you look out there, every year a tree's got you know, more leaves, more branches, and so on. So that is obviously a very, very viable system. And in the process of this huge development of nature, uh, every new form, every new life form, represented another leg on which to stand. And so there was enormous stability. Uh, if you take 100% efficiency, nothing changes. It doesn't get less, it doesn't get more. It's all very boringly the same. 
but our system of te te technology uh, is antagonistic to nature. We have a system where we do not achieve 100% efficiency with anything that we use or that we have created. Walter Schauberger talked to Dr. Fritz Kortigast, who was at that time the head of Mercedes-Benz engine department, and Fritz said, you know, our most efficient engines are only 16% efficient. All the rest is waste. So if you take that as your capital, let's say you start out with 100% capital and you invest it into a Mercedes-Benz engine, you get 16% back. And if you invest that, you get 16% back of that less. So we have got um, a system where, which is going to take us down to um, a very, very unstable and very unpleasant place. Here, nature had many legs to stand on our technology is reducing everything more and more to uniformity. And so we're coming up to the position now in the world where we're standing on three legs. We're standing on the legs of water, oil, and electricity. And if any of those fail, nah, the rest is history. So it's as I put up there, a rather woeful situation. <clears throat> Um, now, where are we? I'm going to look at a few things. Right. Um, I'm going to skip this one because it's, I need to go further. Now, I just want you to... Um, just going to go through these uh, images. I won't say anything about them. Just while you take them in, slowly. In all those images that you saw, you didn't see a straight line or a circle or a point, which are all the elements of the geometry which is in use to make all our artifacts. A straight line is a, uh, in Chinese view, was a very highly dangerous thing, and they made sure on the roofs of their buildings to have a little curve because dragons like to move very fast down straight lines, so this slowed up the dragons. Now, we are using a geometrical system which is totally alien to nature. You can't find it anywhere. It doesn't have any resonance with nature uh, and it doesn't conform to the way uh, natural organisms function or anything that we wish to, to maintain in, in a uh, alive condition is, is not helped by the various uh, shapes and forms into which we store it. Um, the egg, of course, is the, the form chosen by nature to preserve and provide life. Uh, so, the other thing to realize is that energy is primary. That nothing can occur without the energy or the idea of it. What we see as physical form is just the result, the end result, of the ideas and the energies it created. And in this uh, little proportion, which was calculated by Dr. Carlos Rieber, who got the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1984, the proportion between um, physical matter and formative energies is roughly 1 to 100 million. Now just, just think about it for a minute. That means that for most of us, and me included, I'm not including me out, what we touch is what is real. But what we are aware of, actually, is only one hundred millionth of reality. So, formative energies, they must be stratified, they go up to God knows where, it's maybe even up is the wrong word, maybe you need to say they go inside, you know. 
because something that resides in the center can be aware of all things, um, can't be on the outside. So these, um, we have to approach everything from the idea of the energy first. Uh, otherwise, we won't come up with the right answer uh, and how to deal with the problems of traces at the moment, which, we are, which of course are, are multiplying. Now, the way it seems to work, according to Victor, is that while there are energies, and we'll say there's 100 million units of energy, these are divided into male and female because it's the interaction between opposites which um, creates the synthesis, which is the new thing. So here, we could also turn this um, diagram up the other way around, and uh, it would express how perhaps a tree grows in his view, that here we have the formative energies, the red male, the blue female, and the matter which is drawn into the energy wake. But it becomes, it's not vibrating at the proper rate, so it gets deposited and is left behind. So, as Victor said, the a tree is the result of the energies which have flowed from the earth into the atmosphere, uh, and this is the substances which has been unable to be drawn up any further. The real energy and life and vitality of the tree is about 400 meters above it. This is what's left behind. So, uh, that's a, a view of um, a vortex which um, we did it uh, in, with, in Schauberger's establishment in Austria. It's beautiful. Um, all these, oops, all these little um, nodules, so to speak, or uh, part of the vortex, can be uh, interpreted mathematically. Uh, they have their right place, um, and I won't go into that particularly. But um, that's how the the little walls are distributed. Now. <clears throat> So, we come back to energy again, and creative formative motion, according to Victor, is open, goal-oriented, structured, concentrated, intensifying, condensing, dynamic, self-organizing, self-divesting of the less valuable, rhythmical, cyclical, sinuous, pulsing, inrolling, centri centripetal, and outrolling centrifugal movement. It's called in simplified version, the cycloid spiral space curve, which has all those movements in it. Now, basically, there are, uh, there are three basic movements. Um, there is orbital motion, rotational motion, and circulational motion. And these are the various ways in which nature uh, engages in movement. And we need to, as I said, to try and copy these uh, and to understand them more. All right. And one of the principal things to understand in this motion is that uh, there are two movements. Nature will pretty well always use the movement from the outside inwards, and our technology always uses the movement from the in. Um, inside outwards. It's a centripetal move, centrifugal movement. It's an explosion. Um, nature doesn't ever use explosion except under extreme circumstances like um, um, volcanic eruptions and so on. Now, the, the key words, this is what Victor called axial radial motion. So you move from the axis to the radius. And all the values of destruction all the values of friction and so on all increase the further you come away from the center. And the key words for this particular motion are disintegrating, decelerating, dissipating, uh, destructive, divergent, loosening, and friction-inducing. Uh, the other movement, and also, I nearly forgot, noise-creating. So a measure of the extent to which an invention of humanity is working against the laws of nature is the amount of noise it makes. 
because nature doesn't make that sort of noise. Now, here the opposite is the um, radial axial motion. So it moves from the outside inwards with increasing velocity, increasing uh, centering, uh, increasing speed, uh, less friction, less noise, and a lot more power. And so with radial axial motion, uh, the concentration and power is in silence. And if you go out into the forest, there's enormous power, there's enormous creative power out there. There's all the sap moving up to the branches. And isn't it beautifully quiet? <clears throat> uh, yeah, sorry, well, this is just a full cycle of Saturn, just showing that we do actually live in the planetary vortex. Uh, this is the cycle of Saturn. We'll, uh, you can find that in probably most textbooks, I guess, but we'll carry on. Um, now, we come to the, the thing of, of thesis and antithesis and the synthesis, because there are always in this world of dualities, there is the, always the opposite. And they are, generally speaking, in a state of balance with each other of, of dynamic equilibrium, shall we say. Um, and as long as one exists, the other will exist also. If, neither the, if one ceases to exist, then the, all, the other one also um, <coughs> ceases to exist. Now, Victor, uh, this is set out a bit more easily to understand a dialectic unity uh, of thesis times antithesis equals synthesis. And this is the Walter Schauberger's principal equation, 1 over n times n equals 1, where n is any number. So 1 over 2 times 2, a half times 2 is 1, a half times, a quarter times 4 is 1, and so on. So the math is really beautifully easy. It's just up to my standard. And this, this is, these are two columns of opposites, of matter, spirit, egoism, altruism, uh, distance, information density, specialization, generalization, uh, analysis, synthesis, and so on, male, female, uh, negative temperature gradient, positive temperature gradient. And these ones on the left are endowed with male characteristics. So light, gravitation, electricism, expansion, pressure, heat, oxygen, male. And the other one, the blue side are the ones which have female attributes. So spirit, altruism, infinity, order, generalization, darkness, levitation. Darkness in the sense of, um, in a very sort of, uh, what shall we say, pregnant idea. Uh, magnetism, impansion, uh, you know, and so on. And <clears throat> these are opposites are always interplaying uh, in all... Um, aspects of the universe in which we live in, but in order for evolution to proceed, then there has to be a slight increase uh, on the right-hand column, because these are, the, these are the things which actually further and foster evolution. If we were to give these the upper hand, uh, then it would go in the opposite direction. No. Mm -hmm. Right. The upholder of the cycles which support the whole of life is water. In every drop of water dwells the living God whom we all serve. There also dwells life, the soul of the first substance water, whose boundaries and banks are the capillaries that guide it and in which it circulates. This is the part of the talk that I've been trying to get to, uh, which is to do with water. I was going to recite a, a poem of, of Goethe's in this respect. Um, yes, I can remember it, I think. How blossomly, how blossomly I rejoice, all hail to the new, all is born of water and upheld by water too. Transpierced thus am I by beauty and by truth. O oh, great ocean, grant us thine eternal ruth.
For wouldst thou not send clouds, nor bounteous streams endow, nor perfect the currents, nor rivers here and there bestow? Then where would mountains be? And what of plains and world? For thou alone it is that keeps this precious life unfurled. And this is water. Water is the first substance. Interestingly enough, water is written with a W. And if I take that W and I turn it the other way up, it becomes an M. And that says, Mata, Mother. It's the first substance, it's the substance which has mothered all other substances and, and all life, all organic life forms. Um, there is now, I'll just go through these. So first thing, as we said, water is a living substance. Um, according to Victor, water is the blood of the earth and performs the same function in the earth as blood in animals and sap in plants. Sap blood and water are synonymous. Water has as many varieties as there are human beings, animals, and plants. Because water has memory. Water is affected by everything with which it comes in contact. And so all of us, everything that, uh, who we are, it's in touch with our emotions, our thoughts, the water which we have in us. Uh, water has three states of aggregation, solid, liquid, and gaseous. And in terms of, li of this liquid structure, it tends more towards the crystalline. Uh, chemically described as H2O. Uh, and uh, this is really rather boring stuff, so I'll go on to the next thing. Uh, you can find that out in any dictionary, really, or any textbook. Now, this is uh, a diagram which I need to explain one of the very, very core ideas of Victor's and understandings of Victor's about water and indeed you know about energy per se uh, and that is the temperature gradient. Now water has its so-called anom anomaly point at four degrees where it's at its most dense. So a temperature gradient in Victor's view which is positive is one which where the temperature drops from a higher level down towards four degrees set Celsius. Uh, this is a, a movement which consolidates and um, makes the water denser uh, uh, and compacts it. Uh, the opposite movement is the negative temperature gradient, which is any movement either upwards or downwards from four degrees, where the water gets less dense and, of course, in this direction, gets hotter. Because water... Um, the, the hotter it gets, the lazier it becomes, as I said a little bit earlier, in relation to the log flume. Uh, and so you, if you're wanting to organize water flows and so on, then you have to pay serious attention to the temperature gradient, which also is involved in uh, climate at a much larger scale. Um, the other interesting thing on this graph that's all too small to look at uh, is this line here which is the curve of the specific uh, heat of water. Now water has the highest specific heat or one of the highest specific heats of any of the elements and what it means is that water can absorb more heat without changing its own thermal structure than any other element. So interesting Interestingly enough, the lowest point on this curve is at 37 degrees, which is what is the average human blood temperature. Which means that that's why with our blood 90% water, we are able to withstand huge changes in differences in climate and heat without actually affecting our own physical temperature inside too uh, detrimentally. Um, Water isn't, you see, just H2O. Uh, they're actually, the makeup, there are about 33, 33 different substances which make up water, uh, combining different uh, valences, different um, uh, ionization states of oxygen and hydrogen and so on. So it's actually quite a complex little bundle. And when it uh, vibrates, it vibrates in uh, <clears throat> three different modes all at once. Uh, this one is the uh, 
symmetrical vibration, the first one where it's actually, you know, it's actually doing the same thing. Uh, the other one, the next one is uh, uh, sort of more flapping mode, and this one is asymmetrical, so it's sort of moving like this. And if you put them all together in the bundle, that's what uh, the water molecule looks like. And it takes about a million uh, water, water molecules uh, to make one drop of water. Uh, this is uh, some diagrams I, uh, I, I took from a homeopathic um, 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 publication. And this is, shows where, this is the matrix of water. The red circles are all the oxygen atoms and the, the blue ones are all the hydrogen atoms. And this is uh, a substance which is not water, which could be uh, some tincture, it could be a, a, a bit of apple, or it could be anything which is actually with, with suspended within the water fabric itself. And according to the, uh, uh, the way that, that homeopathic preparations are, are made, um, uh, the more you shake it, then um, the more that particular essence is uh, absorbed into the water. And when the very high dilutions come, uh, then that, that substance isn't there at all. And what is left is a sort of hole where the resonant uh, frequencies of that particular substance are still resounding, they're still there. And they're just as real, remember, as the physical stuff because you know, they're one of the hundred million um, energy things which form <laughs> physical matter, see what I mean. Uh, so, that is one of the reasons why homeo homeopathy works. Um, there was uh, an, a, an experiment carried out by uh, Professor Jacques Benveniste at the University of Southern Paris, and I met him, I don't know, about five years ago, unfortunately he's died. But he was asked by uh, the Homeopathic Society of France to prove that homeopathy did not work. And so he went into it with that in mind, uh, but found more and more with his uh, research that it did work. And he eventually presented a paper which showed that with dilutions of 1 to the power of 120, which really means of 1 to 1 plus 120 zeros, that a, a reaction still occurred. And that was, you know, was totally inexplicable to... Uh, science still is to a large extent. Now, where am I going next? Right. Oh, that's more, that's more reading. So, <clears throat> so, here's some, some idea of what wood is used for and how much of it. Um, they're quite, quite alarming. It makes you think twice, uh, for instance, um, about buying a ton of rayon. <laughs> Um, I don't know, can you all see these figures at the back there? Because I can read them out, but um, who at the back can't see them? Oh, well, you're too far away, so that's fine. That's okay. And anyway, I'm married to you, so... <coughs> um, now, this is another one of how much it takes. But look at that. To make one suit is 685,000 litres of water. Oh, well, I better get rid of this, sorry. Um, but I mean, it's just profligate the use of water, and we don't really give it that appreciation that it needs. Uh, water is living substance, it is the mother substance. It's what supports us all. And um, I'll read this out again, because then I, I get myself into the picture. Our science views the blood building and character influencing ur organism water merely as a chemical compound and provides millions of people with a liquid prepared from this point of view, which is everything but healthy water. Good water, good life. Bad water, bad life. No water, no life. Um, I would like just to point out, in case you're not familiar with it, the word er, or the prefix er, which actually comes from earlier English, uh, it is also still current as a prefix in German. It means 
something which goes back to the first principles or the first origin. So the ur organism water is water which has always been. In fact, as Victor said, water has the aspect of being. Because it's always there, it was there, it's now here, and many things have passed and come and gone, mountains, continents, so on. But water has always been. Um, we are also interested, because we do drink it, uh, on the various qualities of water. Now, these are qualities, uh, uh, as described really by Victor Schauberger, uh, distilled water is the purest water. It's actually uh, poisonous. It can save your life if there's nothing else to drink. But you wouldn't want to drink it otherwise, because it's what Victor called uh, juvenile Oh, not even juvenile, it was baby water. And that grasps at everything in reach because it needs to grow, it needs to become mature. So distilled water will leach out from you all your various stores of chemicals and minerals and so on in order to make itself whole. Meteoric water, which is rainwater, has some atmospheric gases, it has no minerals, um, it does have a charge from the fall, um, but it's not a full-bodied full water. And juvenile water is the same, except it's coming from the ground up. And these are the ones, uh, juvenile water is water which comes up in springs, uh, which can occur before it has actually matured. And it is full of minerals and trace elements, but has no gases in it. So it's missing something. Surface water, which is in dams and rivers, um, has, well, three-star quality because it's now even worse. I'll probably put it back to two now because it's also polluted. But generally speaking, it's not... Um, mm, it's got many things in it, but it's, it's just not really high quality. Uh, groundwater has got a greater quantity of minerals and salts. And this, I mean... Um, the groundwater which sits down on the groundwater table, which may be anything from 10 meters to 50 meters or more below. And true spring water, which is high in dissolved carbons and carbonic acid and minerals, is a full-bodied water. It has everything that you need in it. Now, I must just explain something about uh, carbons, because or oh, am I going to explain it back to you in about two seconds? Uh, no, I'm not, but anyway. Um, Victor viewed, um, his view of the elements were, was, that hydrogen was a carrier, oxygen was a lower frequency of sunlight and male, and all the other elements uh, were female or mother substances, uh, which he called in German, carbon. But in England, in English, in my books, I've written an E on the end of it, so it's called carbon, uh, <clears throat> to try and do a sort of shorthand. But that means everything else that is not oxygen and is not hydrogen. Um, so this water, a true spring water, comes out of the ground at the, the right moment, when it is ripe and fresh and can give uh, life to the surrounding uh, uh, areas and people. Artesian water is deep lying and it's, it de depends what it's got in it, whether it's actually uh, drinkable or not. Uh, the water content to the human body is quite interesting to know about, and to be aware of, because everything you put in it uh, is going to go um, to the furthest extremities um, and it's going to affect the way you function. So blood, blood plasma has about 92% water. I, but can I just say, if everybody can see this, because then I won't read it. Can anyone who can't put their hands up the back? Good, then I won't read it. I'll let you read it. <sighs> Give me a break from talking for a moment, too. Um, right. So it's, very, it's really quite fascinating, you know. And here are the brain cells. I mean, they're 85% water. And what happens when you start shoving, you know, Diet Coke in there and all those other things? And your thinking, 
your ethics, your mind, your behavior, that's all controlled from the brain. It's irresponsible to drink that sort of stuff. Now, we are concerned, and Duncan brought it up, you know, we, we've got chlorination, and now we're going to have fluoridation. And just to give you an idea of what, because chlorine is normally administered at about 10 parts per million. Uh, in some countries where the, the climate is rather hot, they put a bit more in. But one part per million is uh, a centimeter by a centimeter by a centimeter in a, a meter cube box. That is one part per million. So 10 parts per million is a little row of cubic centimeters. And that is uh, what is put into the water supply. But I did talk to you earlier about the homeop homeopathic dosage and the efficacies of it. So when we drink that, what we are doing is actually sterilizing ourselves because the water, the chlorine is put into the water to sterilize the water and we drink it and we sterilize our own bodies with that. We interfere uh, with the proper functioning of the cells and the proper movement, movement of liquids in the body. Uh, one of the things that chlorine does is it ousts uh, the oxygen from the um, water molecule. So, and it, uh, what you have instead is a, a hydrogen a chlorine combination and oxygen is released. And that oxygen, of course, has nothing to hang on to, so it becomes a free radical and it does all sorts of damage in the body, makes you look older and, uh, and so on. Um, so, uh, it's something to be avoided um, originally, and then now they're going to have uh, fluoride, which originally started out as a byproduct of the aluminium industry in, the ter in the terms of sodium fluoride. Uh, it was first used as a rat poison, worked very well, um, and it was probably done, well, yeah. let's be kind, uh, <clears throat> because calcium fluoride was perceived to have some benefits uh, for the health of teeth and the body and so on. And calcium chloride does occur naturally and certainly people who live in, in, in places where there's more of that in the water, they've got strong bones. But <coughs> uh, sodium fluoride is really bad news and it makes the bones brittle and so on. So uh, unfortunately, governments have become dictatorships these days and you can't really get them to change their minds. Right, next, 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 right. Um, according to Victor's processes, these are the, the ingredients you would need uh, for putting together about 10 litres of water. Um, these are the more necessary additives into um, uh, a base water, shall we say, in order to create um, a good quality drinking water artificially. <laughs> and then the question arises, once you've got it, what you put it in. And here we come back to natural shapes. The shapes that basically nature has selected for the preservation or propagation of life, which are in terms of the amphora, uh, a rather uh, grain-shaped um, form, or in terms of uh, eggs. Um, and these, these shapes have resonances which seem to, um, well, preserve whatever the contents are. There, there were some amphora like this, which were sealed with beeswax, and they were filled with uh, corn and buried um, in the Middle East, I can't remember the exact place, about 2,000 years ago. And they dug them up and opened them up and planted the corn and it grew. So these, these are the shapes we should really be thinking about putting, holding our vital fluids in. Because here in the egg, um, there are no corners. There are no surfaces in there where there's any stagnation. 
Um, this is one, an egg which is derived from Walter Schauberg's mathematics. Um, and there's one out there which belongs to Duncan, which you can have a look at. Um, but the way it functions is that in the process of evaporation, because it's an evaporative body, it means it's a breathing body, it's not sealed from the outside, it can also take in the energies, the external energies, and transmit them, its own energies. Um, and through the processes of um, evaporation, the surface gets cooled, and the water immediately next to, adjacent to the outer surface, gets cooled, and being specifically heavier sinks to the bottom, and displaces the warmer water there, so, which goes up the center. And so you have this constant circulation of water not quite as violently as that seems to show, mind you, it's actually much slower, but you have this constant movement of the water inside, so there's no stagnation. Uh, the water is always moving, and so in the sense, and what is movement? Movement is energy, or energizing. So, this is a picture, I, I got them in the wrong order, but this is just showing hydrogen as a carrier of oxygen and carbon. Come on. Ah. And this is uh, an aspect of drinking water which is important to understand also, and it's the relation between carbonic acid, water, and carbon dioxide. High-grade spring water has, uh, contains carbonic acid as well. So high-grade spring water um, is made up of, has a content of H2CO2, CO3 in it, which is what the element in the water which gives it body and fullness and, you know, taste and the feeling of well-being when you're drinking it. And <clears throat> with cooling, uh, H2O, which is ordinary water, and uh, carbon dioxide combine to make carbonic acid, which is also known, um, carbon di dioxide is also known as carbonic acid gas. Um, but with heating the presence of light, then the reverse uh, process takes place and carbonic acid transfers back into water and carbon dioxide. And when you take some really good water and you put it in a glass and you put it out in the sun, after a while, you'll see little bubbles form on the inside of the glass. And that is all the transfer of carbonic acid into uh, water and carbon dioxide. And that represents an energy loss in the water, because those bubbles then disappear up into the atmosphere. If you shake them, and they're all gone, and they're lost. So the, the CO2 has been lost from the water. The water has been de-energized. De and when you drink that water, it tastes really, really flat and, you know, tired, which it is. And, <clears throat> um, and this is just an example. These are Cladney plates. Um, these were taken from a book by Hans Jenny. Uh, um, just to show you um, what the effect of heat is, it's quite graphic in the sense that these are black metal plate, maybe two millimeters thick, which is vibrated at a certain frequency, has sand placed on it and the sand uh, reproduces the image that that frequency uh, does to the plate, the way that the plate bends and vibrates. But if, when you have that, and then you touch the corner of the plate with a, you know, with a torch or a lighter, um, a match to it, then that structure suddenly ceases. So heat is a great destroyer. Heat is a great destroyer of the even flow of water, as we saw, as I told you about in the trout experiment. Um, and water needs to be protected from light and heat as far as is possible. Uh, this was a, and a bit of research which Victor did, uh, which shows the difference between the structure of water if it's moved centrifugally, which means from the inside out, or centripetally from the outside in. And all our means, all our pumping systems, our power systems uh, all use centrifugal technology. So the water is destroyed as it's passed down the pipe to us, 
already, or it's destroyed in the river. Um, when it passes through the Pilton wheels in a, in, a, in a hydroelectric power station, the water is disintegrated. The oxygen is thrown out of it. It gets on the back of the turbine blades, starts eating them away, and the water comes out. And the, if there were fish at the outfall of the dam, uh, they, they die very quickly because the water wants to grab the oxygen out of the fish or anything else. And so there, there are quite a few cases known where when a dam has been um, um, established and um, set in motion, the, the fish have died in the stream. Um, the temperature gradient um, and the anomaly point of water, we're going to talk about now in a bit more detail. Right, so as we move up the atmosphere, we can see that there are certain points where this four degrees occurs. Um, so it doesn't constantly get colder as we move vertically. There's always a stratification of things. And so um, between these points, for instance, here it'll get colder, then it'll get warmer between these ones. So at this level it's warmer, and then it gets cold again. And up here, then the temperature rises. And this is one of the funny little things, you know, they don't teach you at school, or they might teach you if you're a graduate at university, is that temperature is not only thermal, but it's also a measure of energy, or the energetic um, motion. So, yeah, well, when you get up higher, it's, it's got to be cold up there, because there can't be anything much to keep it warm. And so it, it sort of backs up one of Victor's sayings, which, um, it, yeah, is quite um, stimulating, that the sun is a cold, dark body. The closer we get to the sun, the darker will be its face. Everything in nature is indirect. So the indirect thing is that from the darkness of the sun, we get light. And if you think about it and just say, oh, oh, oh it's all beyond all reason. Um, the sun radiates extremely high frequency, high energy at the Earth, which none of which is thermal. And the light from the sun, as it were, the energy impinges on the Earth's atmosphere and it slows down and demodulates to frequencies which are then falling into the uh, light spectrum and we can see it. However, that's who said, I'm sorry, that was quite a bombshell. You weren't expecting to hear that one. <clears throat> right. Now, coming back, we're going to get on with water because this is where we live and uh, we've got to deal with things. Now, what Victor, uh, what Victor calls, there are two hydrological cycles. This, uh, there's the full cycle and there's a half cycle. Now, the full cycle is when uh, the temperature of the ground is cooler than the temperature of the rain. That means there's a positive temperature gradient in the movement of temperature from the earth or from the water in the rain into the ground. And that means that the ground will absorb the rain. That, that, that water is absorbed, it sinks down, it recharges the aquifers, it's taken up by the tree roots, some of it flows out to the sea, and then it rises back into the atmosphere again. And uh, on this diagram, on the full hydrological cycle, you see that, that the spirals of the rising transfer, evapotranspher um, water, evaporative water, uh, is going in two different directions. It's not to make one better than the other, it's just to say that they're different. Because the water rising from the sea is arising from a, ba a huge mass of water, which while not dead, doesn't quite have the same intimacy with the atmosphere as uh, trees do with all their branches and leaves and so on. And so that the energies arising above the tree 
uh, with the evaporation, those are entirely different energies um, to the sea's energies. Now, I talked to a, a glider pilot in, in Austria, and he actually took, it, took me up in his glider. And I said to Ma, yeah, well, why don't we go over the town there? There's a lot of heat coming up, and, you know, you'll get up faster. And he said, oh, no. You can only rise upwards over the forest. You can't do it over towns. It doesn't work. The heat is wrong. It's not the right sort of heat. Anyway, so these little particles of moisture, they rise up higher and higher in the atmosphere. Um, they eventually um, consolidate, cool, consolidate, and fall again as rain. But they have been up where they get more information from the sun. So they bring that information back with them, added to which there is the charge generated in the full distance to Earth, which is like that little experiment I showed you with the jets. So the water actually gets charged, and when it, the rainwater hits the plant, there's a huge boost of energy which the plant absorbs, which doesn't happen with irrigation water because the full distance isn't there. So that is a self-reinforcing process and uh, builds up the vitality of the ground and, and the whole of nature and also indeed the stability of the Earth's atmosphere because with this system, the full hydrological cycle, uh, the atmospheric water distribution is pretty even. So it's very stable. But we have engineered the half hydrological cycle and practically the whole of the world is now suffering from this half hydrological cycle where because we have cleared so much because we have used bad farming practices uh, we have changed otherwise green areas into green i mean green water absorbing areas into hot ones and so here what happens is that we have a, pod, a negative temperature gradient between the atmosphere and the ground. And that is, means that when cool rain falls on a warm ground, it won't penetrate it. It's like falling on a hot plate. It just psst, goes sideways. So we, have, we are very responsible for this tremendous disturbance in the atmosphere. Um, we are, you know, as Victor said, um, if, he said this in a book called Our Senseless Toil, written in 1930, uh, if we continue with our current practices in water resource management, forestry, agriculture, and energy generation, the earth will heat up, and then it will go cold. And this is, you know, Maybe this doesn't have to happen if everybody felt, you know, if they got out there and really understood to work with nature's laws and not against them. Um, so we re-green uh, the countryside. We plant trees. We try and re-establish re the, the proper spiral movement out of the earth. Here it's all red. It's destructive. And it's a form of energy which is destructive and then that destruction gets reinforced by the other energy and information it receives from the sun and so it becomes even more destructive and it falls as flood rains and cyclones and God knows what else. Right. Now I think I might just have to be nearly at the end. I'll just see what else is coming. Oh yes. Oh well. Uh, all right, oh no, we'll go back to that one. I haven't time, this is terrible. Um, yeah, you get the spring story, okay. Um, <clears throat> the spring story is there are two different kinds of spring. There is a seepage spring and a true spring. Now, this is a seepage spring, which under the correct conditions of a positive temperature gradient, impotent rain will percolate into the ground, come against an impervious layer, and then run along the gradient according to gravity. 
and will emerge probably at a temperature of somewhere around, well, anywhere around 8 degrees, 9 degrees. And it will taste good, but it's not true spring water. True spring water is different in that we have the same penetration of uh, rainwater under a positive gradient which seeps all the way down um, and there, but there is a counter pressure from below which is the expansion of geothermal heat which pushes the lower very low strata of water upwards so gradually as the water comes down it cools and from it gets compressed by this movement from the bottom upwards and so in the middle of the groundwater table, there is the four degree uh, center stratum, stratum, and this is at four degrees. Um, what this stratum does not have, though, is its full content of dissolved oxygen, which has been absorbed by the tree roots and so on on the way down. So this water, this center stratum, is what it had the character that Victor described, described as nymphomaniac because it had had removed from it in the process of all this infiltration its male aspect, the oxygen. And it wanted desperately to reunite with its male aspect in order to become whole again. And it would find any avenue fissure to rise up to where oxygen was present. And there are many mountain peaks uh, where springs occur, but there's not a catchment area sufficient to supply the volume of flow which is coming from the spring. Now, on some occasions, they had in Austria, uh, high up, they had what they called poison springs, and they fenced them off from cattle, because um, the cattle, if they drank that water, would die. They would get what was known as galloping consumption. And the reason was that the water in the spring coming out had not yet absorbed oxygen, so it was basically a carbon dioxide brew, uh, and it would choke. Uh, anything that breathed it or drank it because it was going to get the oxygen out of them. Now, okay, uh, I derailed myself there just slightly. But anyway, after flowing about 10 meters or so, Victor observed the volume of water coming out of a true spring uh, when it came out and about 10 meters further down he measured the quantity and it had grown. And it had grown because, uh, and it expanded because of its um, absorption of oxygen. Okay, I'll just one more slide and then I'm going to stop. And using this principle we should be able to generate energy from the deep sea at virtually no cost. Because we actually have the similar situation that happens on land where we have water, we have organisms in the sea which gradually deplete the water of oxygen as you go further down. Uh, we have a cooling as you go further down. We have also an upward pressure from below. So somewhere, somewhere, at some depth, there is going to be a stratum of 4 degrees centigrade, which is oxygen efficient. And if we were able to introduce a pipe down there, which has an intake which caused the, the water to move in a vortex as it moved in, um, and we bring it up to a certain point, and then we, this is a detail of this part, uh, and then we infuse atmospheric oxygen into it, which causes this oxygen deficient water to expand. Then we have power to drive a centripetal generator, and all that comes out at the end of it is oxygenated seawater, which was there anyway. So we didn't hurt anything. Right. So all these things are. There are all possibilities. Victor has shown that there are a huge number of things we can actually do if we want to try and change things. But everything is interconnected. And I, I wanted just to finish with this another short poem by Goethe. All things into one are woven, each in each doth act and dwell. As cosmic forces rising, falling, charging up this golden bell with heaven-scented undulations, piercing earth from power sublime, harmonious all and all resounding, fill their universe and time. 
Amidst life's tides in raging motion, I ebb and flood, waft to and fro, birth and grave, eternal ocean, ever moving transient flow. Such changing, vibrant animation, the very stuff of life is mine. Thus at the loom of time I sit and weave this living cloth divine. Thank you. Thanks, Callum. That was your usual high standard. Thank you very much. Um, if you want to chat to Callum... Wow. It's good stuff. It's good stuff. Hey, you don't finish it off like in a poetic way, man. How can you top that? <laughs> yeah. No, it was... He went in, man. He connected a lot of dots for for me. I mean, especially with the yeah, sun. The, that video said about the sun being a cold body. I was like, what? Yeah, <laughs> there's gonna be like a multiple rewatch for me, man. <laughs> Great data, man, for real. Yeah, that was good wow. stuff. I'm glad I found it. It was kind of a last minute thing, so I didn't get to watch all of it, but I watched enough of it to see that he was uh, helping us out, you know. Especially because he's the guy that translated the books into English, so he studied all that stuff. He actually worked with uh, Schoberger's son too, I believe. So. Yeah, it's uh, probably his grandson. Or his grandson, yeah, yeah, his grandson. Yeah. So that was that was a treat. For real. <laughs> I hope you'll enjoy it. Yeah, I'm telling you, I have to rewatch multiple times. Yeah, I've never man. seen it. <clears throat> For sure. I just had to run a documentary and uh, some research on it on Facebook and on some internet websites. But this was a good one, man. He broke it down. <sighs> it's yeah, a was, lot. It was good, beautiful stuff there. For for what he, you know, it's hard to pack half a lifetime of research into you know an hour presentation but yeah he covered a lot of it I think you know it was good even if you've never heard of the guy it was you know it was well presented enough to where you could you, you could understand what he's getting at you know the way nature uh, the efficiency of nature how it's the opposite of of what we do it's opposite literally everything is opposite yeah all our all our uh, tech is like based upon explosion miniature or macro it's all, always explosion and with them it's like the opposite it's like everything based upon implosion it's beautiful it makes so much sense like you said to be yeah. explosion destruction implosion creation <laughs> there you go. To be efficient, you have to operate above 100%. I mean, if that doesn't lay it out for you, <laughs> you know, that's that says all there is to say. You know. There's a quote from him, too, uh, where he talks about uh, nature working in harmony. It would be no stag that greases another's palm. So, you know, it's there. there really is no no need to fight over anything when when nature is uh, efficient yeah when man can learn to down. when man can learn to live with nature you know there's there's nothing to fight about everything's in abundance that's the way it's set up and yeah, we bro, all I, we I'm do not. is conflict with that yeah it's not like like we want to but it's what they impose upon us because our controllers, they don't even like nature, bro. They want to destroy it, consume it, eat it up. Yeah, they're working overtime they right now doing it. Yeah, they know the faster they get rid of nature, the faster they get rid of us. You know how it is. Boom. We're all connected. There you go. That's a great way to put it. Because it is all connected. Obviously, you know, 
I mean, that, that presentation really laid it down to just how connected it really is, you know. It's incredible. It's incredible. It's yeah, Schauberger, yeah, bro. Yeah. Uh, so amazing. True genius, you know, and he laid it down in like simple principles, you know. Yeah. He, he was just, he was a forester and and then just to look at the water and seeing like the spiral patterns in it, he saw that this like uh, this form of movement is is what creates everything, you know, energetic wise. And right. then it was his goal to imitate this movement and his devices that he created, you know. Yeah, and then we're gonna we'll get into some of that too. Uh, Alchemos has some images from. Yeah, it's, this thing was like uh, making naturally inclined, environmentally friendly energy. There you go. Not comprehend, to comprehend and copy nature. That's what he's his book. One of his books. He had several books. There's a few films about him too, but. They're hard to find, uh, honestly. There's a couple, but yeah, you know, I could find like five official little films that were made either about him or with, you know, the help of his family. Yeah, bro, I think so, uh, it would be good material for a movie like uh, Spielberg. Yeah. Do something with it. Man, you ain't kidding, bro. I'll t if, I mean, to me, he's right up there with anyone else as far as. Uh, you know, geniuses from the 30s, there wasn't really a shortage of them, per se. He had quite a few, if you really think about it, you know. Howard yeah, Hughes, uh, you know, supposedly Einstein was a genius. We'll just put him in there because, you know, that's what we've been told. Well, and there that. are so many unknown ones, too, exactly. you know. Uh, I come from different backgrounds, and here, uh, you know, yeah, like Rolf in Italy was also a genius, but nobody knows about him, like uh, Gustavo Adolfo Rolf. Have you ever heard about him? uh huh so Gustavo Adolfo Roll was like uh, after uh, Einstein created this uh, Rosenbridge theory he, to congratulate uh, Einstein on some stuff that he saw that that he saw too. Uh, he phoned him uh, personally, and uh, actually he made like uh, a rose grew out of uh, the desk of Einstein wow. while he was uh, while yeah what? while he was talking on the phone to him. Einstein wrote it in his like autobiography. What? Like, uh, this, yeah, bro, this could be a very interesting subject. Gustavo what? Adolfo Rock. He made a rose yeah, yeah, out of his bro. desk. Bro, that was uh, for me one of the most interesting characters uh, that came wow. from out of Italy and nobody knows him. Yeah, bro, he found different techniques, like he made moving paintings. He invited uh, rich people to his house and then uh, he painted the painting. And uh, while they were like having dinner, the painting uh, moved. Like, uh, wow, yeah, yeah, bro, it's really interesting. Wow. Stuff, man. Wrong, yeah, but you won't find them much uh, on them in English, most is like in Italian. I hear you, that's yeah, that's pretty cool, man. You gotta bring us some yeah. of that stuff over here, you know. Bro, Italy has some interesting characters, man. Uh, if you look at it, like Marconi with all the antenna wire stuff, bro, it was like a uh, genius, too, bro. Marconi, yeah. nice. There were. Fermi, you know, they, from Fermi Lab. There, there you go. They, they shaped the world around us. I mean, they really did, you know. Yeah, actually, you can even include like Werner von Braun with them, you know, because yeah. there's some things too, you know. That's for another uh, time, maybe. But there's so much on it, you know. Right. It's good stuff. Uh, yeah, you want to see like the pictures from uh, the museum? Yeah, let's check out the uh, Schauberger Museum. Alchemist has some images here from, uh, what's the guy's name? Uh, uh, there's a link in the description. SRO. Yeah, SRO. He has yeah. like his own page about the stuff. He visited the museum and everything. He took pictures. Hey, you got the link of him in, in the description. In the description the box, there's a link to the images from the uh, museum here that we're going to check out. So yeah, make sure you all go check that out. Yeah, tell me if it's up. Uh, oh, hold on. Hold on one second. I have to, uh, I have to let you in the thing here. Boom. Hey, Juggernaut in. What up, bro? 
Yeah, bro, I can never forget Juggernaut because he was my 666 subscriber. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> oh, this is a good one, bro. <laughs> yeah, we appreciate y'all checking it out. Man, we're going to dive off in here. If you missed the yeah, documentary, make okay, sure uh, make sure y'all go back later and watch watch the presentation. Anyway, my bad. I didn't mean to cut you off. Wow, bro, the documentary was uh, was great, man. Wow. Yeah, it went in, man. It really it covered a lot, you know. So I'm glad I found it. It was kind of last minute, you know, diving into him for a couple hours and just it's where it took me. It took me off into the you know the realm of the guy who ended up translating the books for him so and then come to find out you know that he made presentation and i was able to find one of them digging through the archives well what was his uh, name again it's callum coates okay, he's okay. a british uh, british guy callum coates it's good stuff man it you know even if uh, even if you've already looked into this guy, you watch that presentation, you'll probably get something out of it, you know. So here, here we're in the museum right here. Damn, that was 13 years ago he was there. Nice. Um, well, you see, here, they, here they say it like uh, five days after he came uh, back to his home country from the USA. Five days later, he died. Man. Yeah, Five bro, days them, after man. he they left them. the U.S. Yeah, and, and, he, and he left the U.S. Like, uh, he sold all his patents, uh, thoughts, uh, innovations, everything, just to get a ticket home, bro. And even, uh, like, an American consortium bought it all up, but they gave him, like, just the money to get a ticket home. And uh, to me, it's, like, really sus. That he died yeah. five, five days later. Bro, bro, come on, man. <laughs> if you do, if you do, uh, you know, easy <laughs> thing. Bro, that is sus. <laughs> Here we go. Let's get that full screen up there. Nice. Oh yeah. See. Wow. Man, if you if you set that up right, it's endless endless supply of energy it's not really it's almost would be perpetual in a way but you got moving parts so it'll have to be replaced eventually so it's not perpetual but. yeah bro this was like his uh, home power station that's badass made. it's like a, yeah this is this is the thing that he didn't want to come out you know <laughs> the home power station bro yeah man talk about free energy device there it is right there yeah, it was like uh, it produced energy by uh, just by water and air. There you go. It was to stimulate the atomic conversion processes through implosion, uh, fulfilling the dream of a non-pollutive energy converter in everyone's home. Man. Damn, bro. Man. It's incredible. It really is. It really is. It's. I can. Yeah. I need one of those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, these things were like created like you just needed uh, like a tiny amount of fuel to start the system, and then when when it's up to speed, it just it's it's on a roll that it keeps going, you know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So you shut it down. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's almost like perpetual motion machine, you know. Yeah. Other than a few moving just parts. You start up, and, and then it goes. Yeah, bro, that's that's what I'm talking about. From water and air. Come on, that's. Yeah, bro, and, and non-pollutive, so no exhaust, nothing. Exactly, there is nothing to pollute anything with because of what it's using to produce the energy. So uh, it was called this Heimcraft work. It's beautiful. So it was like uh, Heimcraft yeah. work. Nice. What does that mean? Yeah, with that thing, you 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 could have your own little factory. You could create things. You could produce things. You know, energy is always the problem if you want to produce stuff. It's true. You know, everyone could have like a small factory and produce things that they need, you know? Yeah. It's like a, a generator. Yeah. Like a huge generator, just free energy, just wow. Incredible. Who knew these things existed, yeah. you know? Like, and he, he even patented a lot of his stuff and 
if you look into it, yeah, you, can, you can five find... Five days before his death, he sold all, uh, everything. He let it all go, huh? Yeah, but huh. probably he was Who under pressure. It? You know? We don't know the details. Really? Yeah, interesting. So he came to America to sell his patents? Yeah, he wanted to come here uh, to America to like promote it and uh, get it into uh, circulation. But you know, uh, the same thing what happened with uh, Jodorowsky with the Dune. Same right, thing, right. bro. Same thing. Man, it's a shame, isn't it? God, dude. It was too much at once, so they know it's so much. So okay, we're gonna divide all that stuff and put it out in so many years to come. You know. And we'll let people dig it up on their own and never really make it a popular thing because it's too efficient right it's too efficient you don't need you don't need a, a wire hung to your house from a pole or underground or something coming from an energy plant miles and miles away or however the hell it's getting here you know you're making it yourself they don't want you doing that yeah bro the system is actually scared of people becoming real creators there you creating go. real things they don't teach you. Uh, they don't teach you how to think in school. They teach you what to think. You know, it's the total opposite of of, of teaching. Yeah, bro. They they done studies on it. Ninety eight percent of children before five years old are geniuses. There Only two percent of people after twenty five years are geniuses. Wow. Damn. It says a lot about yeah. the system. Yeah, that tells you about what the system's doing. Programming us, and few of us are able to see through yeah, it. Yeah, these are the three the show burgers. Nice. Here we go, the bearded man. Yeah, son Walter. This is bad dude. Yeah, what, what the, the PKS, Pythagoras Kepler system. Nice. So that's what they put together. Nice. So their uh, studies are, uh, are uh, under that name, PKS, Pythagoras Kepler system. I like that. Man. Bro, yeah, so these things is what you should have in the garden, bro. These revitalize the water before you give it to your plants or to, to your uh, vegetables, your garden, you know? This is in Austria? It's like based upon like how water flows in uh, nature, like the mini waterfalls, the little basins, you know, to revitalize yeah. the water. Is this museum in, Aus in Austria? Yeah. Because yeah, it seems like... One day. It seems like outside of Austria, you probably won't find much about this guy, man. Really. You gotta look for it. It's not gonna come to you. <laughs> man, the copper was the key to it all as well, huh? Kind of makes you look at moonshine in a little different, the way they make all that stuff in the copper pots. Yeah, they know, bro. Yeah, they do. Like where, where, where do they make the moonshine? Uh, not in a factory, but they go near the creek where the yeah. water flows naturally. You yeah. know? That's why the moonshine is so better than the factory one. Yeah, ain't that the truth? And honestly, moonshine and beer and all that is really, you know, was key because you were able to take the impurities out of the water, you know, make it safe to drink and everything. So, alcohol in a way is kind of like the basis of the civilization. Yeah, it really is. 1933, gotta love that, man. I love it. That was like the height of his uh, stuff from what I could find. It was like 1933, man. He was all over it. And you look at what was happening in America during that year, bro. So fucked off. We went away from the gold standard, all that stuff, you know. It was like... We were being taken over hardcore around that time. And then you have this guy. Okay, so this uh, total also, opposite. Uh, different aspect. Look at the yeah, uh, sorry, copper tools. Yeah, it's like the copper tools is actually good for the soil, you know. If you use iron tools, it uh, contaminates your soil in a way. I heard the copper penetrates the ground better too. 
Go figure. It penetrates the ground easier, copper. It slides in better. It's, the ground wants it. It's like natural substance. You know. Yeah, you see here they show like with this, wow. uh, it's like a mi miniature model of the Hanabo. Wow. And they show the egg shape in the middle. Look at that. And then the vortex around it. It's like a Hanabo uh, miniature. Wow. You know the Hanabo one, can two, you, three. Can you uh, zoom like in on first, that? Uh, can you zoom in on that one? Yeah, yeah. Go to the right. That one in the bottom right corner. Yeah, man, oh, let me screenshot that thing. <laughs> that's pretty cool looking. Uh, yeah, there's a lot going on right there. See the symmetry though. It's a perfect symmetry. You know, that's nature. It's nature. Even the stars look symmetrical, you know. It's all there, man. It's got the infinity, infinity spiral coming off of it, the whole line. Wow. That's beautiful stuff. And there you go, you got your helix, you know. It and did look like the inside of the DNA skull. Is not the same shape. That's what was Double tripping helix me up. Helix is uh, nice. energy form. Man. And it's, yeah, it's all there. And that's what the water was doing when it was traveling through that funnel. That's what it ended up. The shape it took was this helix right here. This, yeah, this spiral. It's beautiful. It actually starts to speed up when it does that too. So... Yeah, I have some of these these drawings too in my folder. It's cool, man. That's cool stuff right there. I would love to have that hanging on the wall. <laughs> yeah. So this was was the one that I think his son uh, and his grandson replicated. But uh, then the first time they used it, uh, the pipe got screwed or something, and uh, it didn't work. And then they shut down the project, but I think it just went, uh, how do you say, under the radar. They still, they probably use this, this stuff in so many things, bro, what we don't know. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you, man. Yeah, the Fibonacci is all over this, uh, all over his work, you know. Fibonacci is what makes us. I mean, if you really look into it. Yeah, so it was the repulsing, repulsing engine. You want to look it up. It's magnetic it's awesome. fields and, and, and Fibonacci's, man. Mag magnetic fields and Fibonacci's make up the everything. All of it. It influences everything. Check that. Yeah, one big magnet with spiral and vortex. There you go. Man, that's cool. Yeah, and it's like a mini flying saucer. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> nice. Man. So, um, can you still, can you still, like, uh, his patents were bought by somebody, obviously, but eventually they become uh, public domain, right? And anyone can use them? Or how does, how do they do that? Because I wonder if, can you get the plans for, for his stuff? Because from what I've seen, even when you find plans for his work, it never really, it leaves key things out that you would need to know in order yeah, to yeah. replicate it. So it's almost even like the, what they were showing you wasn't the actual patent because the patent would actually have that stuff on it. So it was hard to, to find any real like final patent of his work. It's crazy because the few people who have replicated it, you know, it's like, it, yeah, it works. 
So it's not just hearsay. Look at that damn thing. Kepler, the Kepler drive? <laughs> Isn't that like some Star Trek shit, bro? Oh, wow. Robotic bone shape. <laughs> wow. A Kepler triangle. Wow. Check that out. Oh, wow, they explain uh, something about the pyramids, too. Man. Yeah, check it out. It's all there, you know. It's all there, man. Yeah, it's about the golden proportion. Oh, yeah. The divine. Uh, yeah. Yeah, oh, you're nice. like nice. the divine proportion. I like that. Divine proportion. That's pretty good. I might have to take that one. Beautiful stuff right there, man. Hmm. <laughs> Fidus in Sirvis Silentibus. I don't know, it's like uh, Fate and Silent Sons. I don't know, Sirvis. Um, look it up. Is that Latin? Now, uh, Fateful to the si Silent Forest. Nice. Uh, fate to the Silent Forest. Oh, yeah, there it is. Okay. Man, that's what's up. I like that. Yeah, Check so out that Sylvie's woodwork. In, uh, Sylvie's in the forest. Yeah. Yeah, this in the museum, bro. Beautiful. Was this uh, done by his family, or is this just somebody who bought all his work and just put it on display? Uh, I think his grandson runs runs the place, bro. Yeah, it makes so. sense. You'd have to, bro. How could you not look at this stuff, man? You know the time that was put into each one of these things is like phenomenal. You don't just do that shit in a couple hours. <laughs> Look at the handcrafted symmetry and geometry. And all the shapes are inside of the spiral. The infinity spiral. Yeah, this is a good one, man. It's good stuff right there, man. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I'm blowing me away with these images. Yeah, right after, uh, yeah after I did that uh, Showburger post on Facebook, this guy contacted me and he told me, like, this is uh, my website and uh, I took pictures. Then I just asked him, uh, can I use them? And he told me, you can use them if oh, you nice. just uh, link me up in the description. It's okay because it's for everyone, you know? Yeah, yeah it seems like a cool dude. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. Sharing it to the world. Amazing. How could you not put this on yeah, display? Yeah. Man, I want to I want to dive into that thing more. It's like a steam engine or something, huh? Yeah, the, yeah, the repulsing. The Da Vinci of Yeah, these things, uh, yeah, they, uh, they almost look a little bit like some, uh, like, uh, what do you say, like some uh, engines from planes. Yeah. For real, uh, turbines, turbine motor. Yeah. Now I'm seeing all kinds of stuff, man. Like, wow, look at that. Thing, yeah, this right? was for like, uh, uh, this is like uh, for your home uh, revitalization. Wow. Dan Reese, Vortex Water System. Man. Yeah, he came up in the documentary too, the one. Uh, Comprehend and copy nature at the end. This dude is like one guy in America who was continuing the work, uh, but just on the revitalization of water. Man, we tried to. You can't show the comprehend and copy nature on YouTube for some reason. It's on YouTube, but we can't show it to you guys. So. Yeah, it's on YouTube. But it is on YouTube. If anybody wants to watch it, comprehend and copy nature. It's pretty good. It tells you a lot about his work and how they tested a few. Of his ideas out, you know, uh, one of one of his ideas was to put like rocks in the middle of the river, and it would help from washing the bank away, and it would focus the water into the middle of the river, and it helped everything out. It helped all the fish out because naturally that's the type of water the fish wants to be in. 
You know, he was symmetrical mm-hmm. with nature, and it created yeah, energy by doing so. Hey, nice. what doing with nature, bro? Man, that was no cool. You're blowing right through these, some of these, man. I like all of them. Just don't listen to me. <laughs> Keep going. <coughs> There's probably a whole bunch of That one. <coughs> Is that the Eiffel Tower? <coughs> Go back one. <coughs> Is that the Eiffel Tower? Or no, that... this is like this uh, this copper uh, cone shape. Bro, it looks uh, just when like When I saw the this, Eiffel I Tower. always immediately thought about this. I uh, remember this uh, uh, Bronze Age uh, copper druid hats from wow. Germany. Remember them? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, they like, call uh, them. Uh, uh, they call them pickle hobbins. Pickle hobbins. Bro, it looked it looked like this, so maybe it wasn't a hat, but it was like a, a part of Bro. these uh, nice. vortex peoples and engines that they already used you know, <laughs> way back in the druid days. Hey, maybe man, it might not be a bad idea to have a copper hat. Fuck the tin, get the tin foil hat up and yeah. get get a copper one, man. So yeah, the next go. level, copper hat. <laughs> <laughs> Logan, hook me up, man. Bro, for real? Logan, man, <laughs> man. Nice. Wonder what the hell's going on there. <laughs> wow. All these shapes are, you know, it's, it's just uh, yeah, flu- fluidity. It with three right. There you go. Fluidity. Uh, no corners. Isn't that what he said earlier? No corners. Everything's smooth. No corners. Yeah, you're the Nautilus connection. That's badass. Cool stuff, bro. For real. Yeah. Wow. What is that? Holy crap. <laughs> Man, is that a gold one? <laughs> what? This one. Yeah. yeah. Is it painted that way? <laughs> what is going on there, man? If that's a real gold Nautilus, I gotta have it. Bro. <laughs> wow. Get out of here. I would love to know more about that little piece, man, because that's really got me right now. It doesn't look painted. Yeah, and what's this thing here, bro? Let me write it down. Yeah, that, that's what caught my eye, and then I saw that damn gold Nautilus, and I'm like, why is that thing gold? Yeah, that, what is that, for real? Is it like bones or something? Yeah, you see uh, the, the pine cone laying next to it. Bro. So obviously, you know, it's a display of, yeah, of the divine, uh, man, what was it? Uh, man. Yeah, there's even wow, more, bro. Dude. Look at that. Look at that one's like, uh, wood grain <laughs> then you got the the one in the back there it looks like a petroglyph the spiral that's on that stone in the very back keep going up right there in the middle that spiral that one yeah bro you know uh, when it's stone it was a long time ago and if it was a long time ago things were much bigger so you're actually looking at something microscopic now <laughs> For real though, you're microscopic, you know what I mean? Like, on the scale of it all, you're like, it just keeps really? going too. The infinite, uh, it just keeps going. That does look painted though from that angle. That Nautilus. There's the hyperbolic funnel. Yeah, there's your funnel that turns into that helix at the bottom. It's the most yeah, efficient. this is the one that makes like the du- double helix. It's the most efficient way yeah. for water to travel. Wait, let me check. I have a note on this. Uh, yeah, this like this funnel uh, uses the turbulence of the water to create a stable pulsating structure out of swirling chaos. Nice. 
I love that. <laughs> I love that. And it's, you know, he achieved this by sitting on a riverbank and watching the whirlpool. You know, that's where he discovered how, how the movement it would make. And then he went home and he replicated this funnel. How, how he came up with these designs, shit, who the fuck knows, man. But anytime he tried to, he would get the result that he expected, like, he expected bro, to do that. Bro, what, what, did all, what did they all do? Da Vinci, the same thing, bro. He went to the forest yeah. and look at things. That's true. Everything worked, how the birds fly. Uh, <laughs> that is true. That's, what? that's how he found out, bro. Not, not, not with the books, but with your eyes, you yeah. know. Exactly. We already know that shit. It's already in us. Exactly, not in the books. That's enough. It's not in the books. It never was. You have to learn this stuff for yourself, you know? Hey, bro, I'm not saying, you know me, I, I read a lot of books, you know? But yeah, I'm not saying don't like read a, books. Not, it's not the source you need to, to source your needs. <laughs> exactly. I want to I want to build some of this stuff, man. You know, I need one of the free energy generators. Shit, I just need some. Hey, copper. bro, but even his son and grandson had problems putting it together in the right way. Crazy, bro. Yeah, <laughs> that's the thing, you know, that I was noticing with his work was either he didn't finish drawing it out because he was protecting what he was, you know, but none of it was complete none of it that's just from what I could find in a few hours of researching him I'm not saying what he was doing wasn't working because we see you know his plan put to action you know in numerous other things so but the big designs like the generator and all that stuff there were parts missing that you would definitely need to know what was happening in order to replicate yeah just so uh, the knees and the chair Oh yeah, welcome, Please. welcome everybody. Forever too. Okay. Forever. Yeah, I'm not checking the chat the whole time. You know how it goes. Well, always when we stream, you want to check, but then you're just into it talking and forget. Yeah, my bad, guys. I'll see you guys out there though. Thanks for coming, checking us out, hanging out with us, sharing your thoughts. We're talking about Victor Schoberger. And his uh, studies of water, especially water, but everything really. You know. He, yeah, he, th this was something like he based upon like a Kelvin generator. It's like uh, when water is falling to these copper spirals, uh, the thin strands of water produce high electrical voltages, and tiny droplets change direction of fall, contrary to the cause of gravity, and move back upwards. The levitation effect caused by electrostatic charge like uh, this uh, good for healing they say if you go near a waterfall well, it has the same effect the water go upwards too if you breathe that uh, people with asthmatic problems it helps too so it's like uh, some type of healing device that, which causes the water to levitate and have some healing property upon you yeah and then uh, earlier you know yeah, bro, I took some notes here and there you know because it was a lot uh, it's good it's good and we learned about how water at a temp certain temperature starts to produce levitation, you know, and the way that the fish were able to jump up, you know, up a waterfall and onto another stream without, they don't even have to move. <laughs> this shit's wild. Make sure y'all go back and check that out. Awesome stuff, man. Yeah, it was wild, bro. For real, I was. I'm still blown away by all this stuff. I, yeah, this is good stuff, man. And then, because he, you know, he he perfected yeah, he the uh, flumes. He perfected the whole flume and how how to sort the wood out and how to move it efficiently. How at a certain temperature the wood, well, had the water hit a certain temperature it would start to pull the wood down you know it would move it more efficiently he could move logs that were heavier than water right they could still hey, be bro, some of the 
some of his uh, his works are still used, bro. They are like uh, uh, some uh, some are these old uh, bobsleigh tracks they use, or or these the, actually were the flume locks. That's how bobsleighing started, bro. Nice. With, uh, on these wow, that locks. makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, bro. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe maybe without Schauberger uh, we wouldn't have had even the movie, you know? Yeah, yeah. really. <laughs> nice. I love it. It was what was the name again, man? Uh, cool running. Cool running. Yeah, cool running. <laughs> Hell yeah, bro! That's the classic. <laughs> classic stuff, man. Cool running. Classic stuff. So, Back you know, he. Are you dead, man? It was about redemption for him, probably because of doing this right here to Mother Nature with his yeah. flumes, man. His flumes, you know, he helped destroy Mother Nature, but he knew how important Mother yeah, Nature was. Yeah, not just there, because his, his works were used all over the oh, world. Oh, man. Woo! I'll tell so you what. Was, yeah. Once they realized, hey, wow, look at all this wood, how fast we're moving it. Yeah, we got to do this everywhere. So, yeah, in a way. And it's sad, too, because we all know about that side of... We don't know it was him responsible for it, but we all see this side of the work he did, you know? we And probably all we'll ever see, as far as mainstream goes, is this side of the work right here, the destruction. And they won't show us how he redeemed himself with showing us free energy through nature. Comprehending yeah, bro, copy great. nature. I'm out of uh, redemption, you know? Redemption Road right here. That's the story of redemption. For real. Yeah. It's good stuff. And at least he had the opportunity in his lifetime, you know. I think, uh, to redeem himself, too. Not everyone gets the opportunity. Maybe are some videos. Later. Oh, yeah, nice. You see all the water uh, attached to the outside, like some type of medication. Yeah, like. right, exactly. It doesn't travel uh, down the middle. It travels around the outside of the tube. So, you know, you have the pressure of the atmosphere helping to pull it down, you know. It's the most efficient way to, to travel water, by far, is right there. And that's why, I, that's the shape you see on a tornado, it's the shape you see on a water spout, because it's the most efficient shape to, to travel through uh, the state of liquid, or the state of ether, however you want to look at it. Yeah, it's like the way our tubes are set up, it's like uh, the, the bottom part of the tube contains water always and there's always the upper part not containing. Yeah. But in this case, it actually yeah. attaches to all the sides and at least like uh, not the bottom and upper part, but it has the outside part and the inside part is hollow because the water runs on the, on the inside of the tubes. So it creates this vortex that on the inside of the water it remains air. It induces the flow, you know. Right, exactly. Right, exactly. Induces the flow. The water doesn't stagnate, you know, but it keeps revitalizing also. There you go, it revitalizes itself because when you create turbulence in water, that creates negative ions. That's good stuff. If you want that. So that's, you know, another bonus from what any of these machines are doing is creating all those negative ions, you know. Think about the amount of negative ions coming through that funnel. The way that water was traveling through there. It was producing a lot of negative ions. That was some good water coming out of there. That would be a great way to, to charge your water. If you had one of those funnels. Thank you. 
Oh no, that's great, man. The copper, you know. Copper. Copper and a magnet is how most magnetic fields are generated. Especially if you have an electric motor, you know, it's copper's a copper and magnets. So. I'm not seeing many magnets in here. You don't need them, I guess, the way he's doing it. The repulsing. Where's that? Where's that cone again? That double helix produced uh, through the cone. And the cone is the shape, you know, the divine shape, whatever it's called earlier. I have to go back. Yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah, it turns into the double helix. You know, that we see in so much uh, symbology. Yeah, creating a stable structure out of swirling chaos. I love it. <laughs> There's that fountain. Even the algae was growing. Did you see how the algae was growing in the in that spiral pattern? That was cool. kitchen funnel, you know, it's the same shape, basically. Yeah, nowadays you see these new mega structures, who buy and stuff, you know, they, yeah. they do the same thing as what you see here, so maybe they're already preparing to use it as some uh, new hmm. energy machines, hmm. you know. That's a good okay. point. It could be harnessing energy in some sort of way already, you know, like, they could still be doing that too. Maybe even subconsciously, you know, these designs are produced. Bro, I wasn't. Uh, sorry. No, you're good, bro. Go ahead. Yeah, bro, I was, I was on this rabbit hole once. Uh, like all these mega structures, mostly you have to look into them. The largest structures in the world, uh, new world structures. They have like these uh, really interesting artworks at the top of them. Like uh, on the highest level. Interesting. Yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah, I'll have to check into that. Because there are some pretty amazing structures being yeah, built today. Check that out. See, there's your funnel shape again, you know. The, the vortice, whatever, vortex. Chevy made a motor called Vortex. That was just, man, one of the best motors they ever made. They had to stop making them, they were so good. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just a little vortex induction you know added a bunch of power to it just by in inducing the air in a vortex Bro, this is almost some Walter White stuff, man. <laughs> the blue was like, yeah, what's going on there? <laughs> it's spinning, you know, it's causing that, that funnel shape. The natural, the natural funnel shape produced. You, know, you see it everywhere. You see it in nature, you see it in the tornadoes, water spouts. Same, same deal. 
Yeah, I have to say, man, uh, some really cool footage. That's uh, cool. Man, there's almost a wow. like a penny. Pentagon, pentagon shape in the middle of that. Yeah, they, I think they have just have a mirror underneath of it that you can see the spiral in it. Wow. Wow. Dude, yeah, that's cool. I was wondering what was going on there. <laughs> yeah, it was like a mirror. Wow. I can see it. That's you know, incredible. Like a museum, we have to show up. Wow. But it's cool, bro. Wow. For real, that's it cool. almost look like the, the, the spiral nebula of the galaxy, bro. Yeah, that's why I was tripping. <laughs> I'm like, wow. And and that's another yeah, bro, yeah it's, the it's galaxy. Based on the same principle, uh, micro macro. Yeah, micro macro, same thing, bro. Yeah, it never stops, huh? Micro macro. Yeah, never stops. Man. And, yeah, incredible. Incredible. It seems so simple, but, you know, it's, it's really incredible, man. Yeah, it's just, it's just, just used for energetic water activation. Being able to harness, you know, harness nature and make nature work for you. See how it forms. You see the spirals happening. It's like multiple spirals even going into there. That's how efficient the water's moving. Look at the shape it makes coming up the bottom. That shape is similar to the shape that. Um, you know, the egg shape that he's was using throughout his work. So even the byproduct of the water traveling at that shape makes another, you know, geometrical pattern. Pretty cool. Yes, yeah, so, uh, you see, it's to make noble water, you know, like nobility mm. water, edel. Yes, yeah, good noble stuff. Water. <laughs> Good stuff, man. Yeah, this was actually uh, the pattern thing on the left and on the middle. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it looks like a tur uh, a turbo that you put in your car. <laughs> I'm seeing like car parts and shit in these, <laughs> in these designs. <laughs> man, that was good stuff out. Appreciate that, man. Hey, thanks, bro. Yeah, you, I mean, you inspired the whole stream, so. And we appreciate everybody coming out, hanging out with us. Hope y'all enjoyed it. Uh, if you guys got anything, any comments. Yeah, one, one final. Uh... Yeah, yeah. You want, yeah, you want to finish it up? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. No, no, it was good, bro. It was good. Uh, there's, there's too much, you know. There's <laughs> a lot. Going, I mean, if you got more, you got more. All right. If you got more, we can look at more. Shit. And maybe the folder, if you want to see the folder. Oh, yeah, break it out. I figured that was the end of it. My bad. Hold on, let's get you on the... Yeah, let's bring up the other folder. That was, that was really good stuff. Uh, the museum there, it was loaded with Schoberger goodies. Um, yeah, we're going to get into some more here. He's got another folder with, I think, some of the stuff that he made a video about. So y'all make sure you go over there and check out the videos. Yeah. He's been making a lot of really well, good stuff. Hey, the video is not done yet, bro. Okay. You still haven't done yeah. the show burger. Nice. No, Let's see, bro, he brings I it here to, first. I got you know? with, uh, with the other <laughs> genius, uh, Walter Russell. I did that one. That's out though. He brings it on here 
even before he makes something so this is some exclusives right here right from the Alchemist files it's probably what I should call this from now on the Alchemist files this is all you bro I appreciate you you know bringing the wanting to come on and share it with us hey bro for me it was also like only so, so maybe maximum half a year ago I found out about Show Burger when I put up the documentary and then they took it down and then I say okay this is too interesting because they took it down for a reason yeah. then I told you uh, you looked into it a bit and you say okay this is really interesting hey, yeah look, I, was I wish I could yeah, I wish I really could compre comprehend all this stuff and explain it but at least we, we put people on a lead you know like uh, there you can look for it there you can find it yeah, you can learn. You can learn from it, and eventually, man, if you study it long enough, you'll start to understand what's going on here. And maybe even you can get in trouble too. <laughs> Just don't bring it to the U.S. because <laughs> I'll take you out, man. Yeah, hey, I thought this was cool. Like this was the last picture on the right. Nice. Uh... Rocking the beard and the polyester suit. I gotta love it, man. Yeah, he was nature's big boss. I like that. <laughs> yeah, I saw some books that he made. Yeah, they man. worthwhile reading all of them, you know? Bro, a lot of them are in the archives, too. I was looking through a couple of them last night, man. yeah. But stuff. some of them are like only that you can borrow if you log in. Yeah, yeah. Some, <laughs> but most of the good ones you have to log in to borrow. Mm -hmm. For I don't real. know how it works because I never yeah. logged into it. <laughs> Hell yeah, man. It's worth it though to do all that. You know, if you're into it, I'd do it. You find out some cool stuff. Here we go with the tornado. You know, the helix inside. Yeah, it's all there, man. It's all there. Though. Wow. Hmm. Man. That is like some Da Vinci stuff right there, bro. Oh, if y'all go to my channel in the in the community section, uh, that picture there with the tree, it looks like a tree, it's not actually a tree, the one on the right, yeah, there's a, I put up a, a side by side with that and a petroglyph from Hawaii, and very similar, very similar. It's kind of wild. So maybe, you know, it got me thinking about some of those petroglyphs being actual symbols for these different types of energy fields that are produced. Because that's what that is. That's a graph of an energy field that's produced. That's what most of these are. They're graphs of energy fields. And he replicates them. It's pretty incredible. Yeah, the universal egg shape. The, the whole, uh, if you look through a lot of the old artwork too, they're always holding the egg. You know, the cosmos is the shape of the egg, supposedly. It's all inside the egg, you know. It's all there. If you look at a lot of those old paintings of, of of Jesus and God and Mother Mary and you know the Madonna whatever you want to call it they're holding the egg that same exact thing right there the archetypal vortex that's good stuff man 
And that's that's like a turbo a, a turbo motor right there basically or, or a, you know water station check that shit out entropy wow wow wavy man truly hot is it <laughs> Is it from, it's from the spiral though, right? So, and, and it pulls too, you know, it's pulling as, as it travels, so. It's actually a way to make things travel faster, is to put them through uh, one of these funnels. And it'll, it'll make things speed up. Or go in the other direction, it might make it slow down going from small to big so which direction are we headed in hmm <laughs> there's your water wizard good stuff <clears throat> wow Avengers check that out these guys so I don't know most of those dudes man <laughs> yeah th this like Buckmaster Fuller uh, he did these uh, these drawings I show in uh, Utopian Dystopian but a few of them were, for, were from him too yeah uh, it's okay. like an architect I recognize old lead Skullman and Tesla and yeah, Walter Russell too with the Wave Universe. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That was dope. See, I didn't know who he was till you made that video. Yeah, when Tesla saw Walter Russell's uh, works, he said, like, the world will never be ready for it. Nice. He was blown away by it. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, bro, but you could <laughs> add so many to, to, to this list, you know. Sure. It's a great list. Man. Yeah. Nice. And that's yeah. That's like a, a boat propeller too. They're very similar shape. Very similar shape. Welcome, welcome in. Good to have you. Hey, Asta. And a lot of these, <clears throat> a lot of these diagrams are on how to charge your water too, right? So, rejuvenate it. It's also called rejuvenating. You know. Yeah, there is a picture in here uh, from that device. This, this is like this water revitalizer. Nice. Yeah, revitalizer. If you have like a pond or something, you should act this. Then every like everything grows better. Uh, every the fishes uh, recreate better. Everything goes better if you nice. have this. Because wow. water, after a while, it becomes dead. You know, and this thing like revitalizes it. It's water amazing. needs to breathe, to eat. Wow. Incredible. 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 You gotta love it, man. And there's your egg shape again. Yeah, I see in some of these experiments that they put like the egg, an actual egg inside of a, a tube with water and start uh, the water flow and then the vortex create too, if you just uh, put the egg in the water. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. <clears throat> I know what you're talking about. The egg reacts to that vortex. There's no corners. No corners is what, you know, these designs were about. No corners. It's just smooth. Any, and it's about implosion, not explosion. So it's the total opposite of everything we do. Basically, the way he put it was, if you're not producing over a hundred percent, you're not going to thrive. You have to, you have to produce over a hundred percent. So, and that's what nature replicates. And really, this shape here on the bottom right. And it's in the middle now is how is why the tree is the shape it is because that's that that's how the ether is pulled up from the ground naturally so the tree is 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 shaped by this uh, this force this unseen force
Yeah, I think this was the wrestle. I'm not sure. Oof. Yeah, basic shapes. Yeah, it's all. It all comes together, you know. It's all inside the spiral too, you know, the spiral. The, yeah, it's all there. And there's your. That's why the tree is the shape it is. Yeah. It's how the ether reacts to the earth. Yeah, bro, my message, you know what I'm gonna say. Be like water, my friend. Oh man. It's <laughs> not bad advice. <laughs> That's good stuff, man. Yeah, thanks, G. Appreciate it, thanks. Man, there's a lot to take in there, you know. It really is. Here, let's, uh, let's see something. Here. Yeah, for myself, uh, for sure, I'm gonna dive deeper into it, you know. And the documentary that you showed, like in the beginning of the stream, uh, immediately I'm gonna rewatch it. <laughs> yeah, it's worth um, it's worth checking out because yeah, you know this guy he. This guy, he goes into great detail on Schoberger's work, so it's worth having another look. I mean, I watched it twice and got something out of it both times. I'll end up watching it again, I'm sure. But the stuff about the fish traveling without moving, you know, literally, it propels forward without even moving, just naturally from the way the water flows around it. It moves without. Yeah, it's amazing. It's incredible. If, if you really, you know, just think about the the implications of it. And uh, I've never heard of the guy before. Alchemist mentioned him, and, and you know, I appreciate you for uh, bringing it on, man. We'll do yeah. something again uh, real soon. Sure, bro. We're gonna go ahead and call it. Uh, yeah, everyone, if Thanks anybody if anybody want uh, wants to come on you know the next show you can yeah. email me and we can set something up man you know knowledge at gmail .com. shoot me an email and we'll, if you guys want to come on we're, we're game we'll have everybody on so we we do appreciate y'all coming out. Much love to everybody. We'll see you on the next one. Yeah.